Hi, I'm Dave Waddell. I've worked for the past 30 years helping schools improve the environmental health and safety of their science, art, and technology programs. As an offshoot of this, I've helped amateur and professional artists stay healthy and protect the environment while creating vibrant art. Today, we're going to be talking about toxicology in terms of art hazards. And uh, even though the two don't necessarily seem to go much together, art and toxicology, hopefully today you'll understand where the two concepts of creating art and um, toxic exposures can overlap and uh, the risks that they can pose to artists. So in the first part, we'll be just doing a quick broad overview of the concept of toxicology. There are several questions that I get uh, from artists related to toxicology all the time. The first is, so you're talking about hidden hazards in the arts. What is a chemical hazard that I could find in the arts? And how can I tell if my products contain them? How could I be exposed to one? And what can I do to reduce my risks of harm from chemical hazards that may be in the art products I use? And a big one is, I know there's safer alternatives out there, but will I sacrifice the quality of the art I'm creating if I change the products that I'm using? Let's back up for a bit and we'll start by talking about the concept of toxicology and the, the study of toxicology. Uh, this has been around for a long time. Paracelsus is considered the father of toxicology. He lived back around the year 1500. And one of the things he came up with is the concept that all substances are poisons. That the only thing that differentiates a poison from a remedy is the dose. So aspirin is considered very, very helpful, but in a very, very large dose, aspirin could be quite toxic. So the difference between a dose and a poison is, or a remedy and a poison, excuse me, is the dose. So one of the things we'll be looking at is this idea of a dose and response. So if you get a dose of any chemical, what kind of response could you see? And what's the boundary between a non-toxic response and a toxic response. The easiest way I can explain it is, is to think of the dose response curve in terms of the one tequila, two tequila, three tequila floor concept. If you look at the chart shown here, uh, this is a classic dose response curve. It's very stylized. And what you notice is as we move up the chart, we're increasing the response. So this is a visible negative effect that we're seeing, an adverse effect on someone. As we move to the right along the chart, the number of doses are increasing. When you start out with our one shot of tequila, for most people what we'll find is we won't see much of a response. Maybe a little flushing of the cheeks, maybe a slight dilation of the eyes, but really not that much. So at that point, we're at the NOAEL, or the No Observable Adverse Effect Level. We're not seeing any problems. When we have another shot of tequila, or maybe two more shots, now we're gonna definitely start seeing uh, responses in people. Maybe they'll start speaking a little more slowly and carefully. Maybe the words will be slurred a little bit. They'll have to work harder to pronunciate something like the word pronunciate. Maybe they'll be walking a little bit more carefully. Uh, maybe they'll suddenly be talking louder and everybody will be their friends. At this point, we're at the lowest observable adverse effect level. We're starting to see physiological responses to chemical exposure. If you look at the curve as we move, move past the LOAEL, that lowest observed uh, adverse effect level, you notice the curve starts getting really, really steep. And that's because at some point, even a small increase in dose can create a great increase in response. And this is something else we notice if people are drinking quickly uh, quite often they'll get much more drunk than they hoped to or they expected to just because uh, their system is responding much more rapidly to it. And then at the top of the curve, we notice that the, the dose response curve has flattened out. And this is because once you've had, I don't know, 20 shots of tequila, let's say, uh, we're not going to see much difference in your response. You're going to be face down on the floor going blah, 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 blah. And even if we put an IV into you, uh, nothing's going to visibly change, except eventually you could potentially die. So what we're trying to do with our doses to ourselves in our exposures to art hazards is to stay down below that lowest observable adverse effect level. It's very hard to prevent any exposures to any chemical uh, contaminants in the natural environment these days, or the man-made environment in particular. But you can try to modify that a little bit. Now that dose response curve is based on 
a 180 pound, 25 year old, healthy white male, which I meet very seldomly and almost never attends any of the workshops I do. What we do find is a great deal of variation in the size, uh, size of people and the ages of people. So let's look at the photo we have here. What we have is a very young little girl with a great big cup of coffee in her hands. If she actually drinks that entire cup of coffee, she's gonna be bouncing around the trees in this campground like she was a ping pong ball shot out of a cannon. And then we look at her father, six foot four, 275 pounds. He probably needs to drink five of those cups of coffee in the morning to even feel much of anything. So the size of the container that we're putting that dose into matters. An equal dose into a small person and a large person is not an equal dosage in terms of their overall uh, body weight and the amount of material that's potentially impacting them. What are the ways these toxic materials can get into you? There are three primary ways. You can swallow it, you can breathe it in, or you can touch it and have it absorbed through your skin. Ingestion is the easiest one to avoid. Uh, wash your hands after you work with toxic materials. Don't eat lunch in your studio if you've got toxic dust or solvents around. And uh, keep your hands out of your mouth. None of that works when you're talking about toddlers. So if you're tracking your chemical contaminants home with you and it's getting in your carpet and you've got a toddler crawling around and they're putting everything in their mouth, then you need to worry about ingestion. Uh, inhaling materials is definitely the easiest way to get toxic materials into you. And that's because it's very hard to hold your breath the entire time you're creating art. As far as touching it goes, uh, many materials do not absorb through your skin. Some do, and you need to be aware of the difference between the two and take precautions to keep that stuff from getting into you. But inhaling toxins is definitely our easiest avenue to exposure. The question I always get is, well, geez, am I getting dosed by these toxic chemicals? And the answer is in modern society, of course you are. Everybody's constantly being dosed with chemicals. If you have carpeted floors or padded furniture, then you've probably got flame retardants in those. And those materials are undoubtedly in your bloodstream. Bisphenol A is the stuff that was in polycarbonate or Nalgene bottles. And uh, we find that stuff in everybody. It's in the glasses I'm wearing, uh, impact resistant material. They're great for coating stop signs and for glasses where we don't want things to break. Not so great for dishes. Uh, phthalates are ubiquitous in the modern environment. They're a plastic softener. Those beautiful, cute little rubber duckies that you like to give to your kids uh, are made from PVC. PVC, if you look at the pipe, is really, really hard until you add phthalates to it and that softens it. And those things release uh, and we end up inhaling them and getting them into us. Uh, diesel exhaust, I live in Seattle, urban environment, diesel trucks going all over. Wood smoke fragrances, food additives, all of these things are found in people's bloodstreams, which is kind of terrifying. But the real question is, so what that we find these household chemicals in people? Um, do we really need to worry about it? How big a deal is this? Well, most of these exposures are very, very low level. Some of these compounds at low level can cause problems. But in general, what we find is that um, we can take steps to try to reduce the effects that those things have with knowledge. Uh, chronic exposures to things that are not acute toxins where a short dose would cause great harm, uh, there are a lot of things like the phthalates and the bisphenol A that uh, we don't really know necessarily what kind of impacts they're gonna have because you've got this mixture in your body and it's very hard for us to study multi-chemical exposures to toxins. It's pretty easy to study what one thing does over time, um, but it's much tougher to discover what that one thing does when it's mixed with 27 other chemical compounds in your body. And we're still trying to figure out how to do that. The bottom line though is that our bodies can handle a lot if we give them a chance to, to clean out. Uh, so breathing fresh air uh, in between your exposures and minimizing those exposures you have makes a lot of sense. And if you're smoking cigarettes regularly, um, then my advice would be uh, that art hazard exposures may not be your primary risk from inhalation that you're facing. So try to avoid those exposures you can. And in the modules that follow this one, we'll talk a little bit about what specific compounds to watch out for and what steps you can take to try to protect yourself from those exposures. 
And then finally, this is the hierarchy of prevention that we'll be talking about throughout these modules on toxicology. And they range from the most effective way of protecting yourself from getting exposed to toxic stuff, which is by just don't use toxic stuff. Don't wanna get lead poisoning? Never work around lead, and you don't need to worry about it. Down through using less toxic stuff, and then into trying to suck the toxic stuff away from you, and finally creating some kind of a barrier between you and the toxic stuff, which is the least effective method, but if it's the best you got, then it's the best you got. And we'll get into more detail on this in the coming modules. Thanks. To learn more about chemical hazards in schools, visit doh.wa.gov slash school environment.